yourself before your God. Your words were heard, and I have come in response to you. God hears us. God hears us. This is my God. And it's a privilege to be with you again, and uh, to share with you as uh, you're here to do a week prayer. Amen. I was excited about the week of prayer. We'll try that again. <laughs> it is a privilege. And I want to talk about prayer with you because prayer is both a exciting opportunity and also I'm very glad that the scriptures tell us in Romans 8 that it's also a weakness. We don't know how to praise we all. But the Holy Spirit helps us. And so what I want to do this morning is share some of the lessons and principles that I've learned through my journey regarding prayer, particularly from the life of Daniel. And uh, I want to talk about standing in the gap. The message is called No More Gaps, Praying Like Daniel. I am a king in my white life and used to be a house painter at one point, and I was counted with the number of tubes with no more gaps I used. And I reckon probably half the homes in the country are held together by no more gaps. If you've ever used it, you know what I'm talking about. And Ezekiel tells us, and Isaiah tells us that we've been just read. This extraordinary to me, extraordinary truth that God looks for people, ordinary everyday people, who will stand in the gap in intercessory prayer. What's the image of standing in the gap? In ancient times, cities were essentially surrounded by walls built to fortify to protect them. Under the siege and warfare times, the opposing armies attacking around them were seen through, you've probably seen it in the movies, battery rams, catapults, to create a what? A breach in the wall. A gap, a hole in the wall in order to enter into the city in order to take over and destroy it. Soldiers were trained that when a gap, a breach appeared, they would step into the gap to become, as it were, a defense of a breach in the wall so there would be no more gaps. That's the image that is being portrayed when God cries out, I look for a man, a woman, who will stand in the end. Because there's a breach in the wall, and the enemy has the ability to come in and break heaven. This is the picture. I don't know about you, as we look at the world around us, there are gaps, breaches in the wall in every sphere of our culture and society. It is breaking down. Not just with what we see happening internationally, but what we see happening in politics and education, in the brokenness of families. There are gaps. I remember a man named Arnold Twinby, who was a historian who researched and wrote about history and civilizations from the beginning through to the time he passed away. Wrote an aspect to the volume Skip, for which I was very grateful, some of the residents are too. Similar to what a man called Will Durant wrote in 12 or 15 volumes on the story of civilization, uh, Durant's one of my favorite writers. And these guys considered civilizations and history not just what unfolded, but why did whole civilizations break down and even distant? 
What was the cause of the breakdown of whole cultures and civilizations? And I'm bringing this down because this is relevant to this man, Daniel, because what we're looking at is a man who was taken into captivity as a young teenager, and when we encounter him in the Bible, in this intense period of successful prayer, he's in his 80s. He has seen civilizations, kings and kingdoms, come and go, rise and fall. I'm telling you that this word summarized the reason the civilization is brought down. It's not a fortune on your PowerPoint. I'm just going to really read it rapidly. And I want you to think about the news you hear. How cross is the lawlessness? Number one. Two, a loss of economic discipline. Three, rising bureaucracy, which is control. Four, decline of profitable and valuable education. Five, the weakening of all cultural foundations. Six, the loss of respect for tradition. Seven, increase in love of materialism. Eight, the rise of immorality. Nine, the decay of religious beliefs and the God's dead theology. And number ten, the devaluing of human life. Doesn't sound anything old, does it? It's quite the top ten news items. When we hear stuff like this, prayer becomes the first thing we should do in response. And prayer is a challenge. I know as one of the pastor for the past several decades, that when you announced prayer meetings, I always used to pray for what Jesus said when two was pray together in my name. Because sometimes the prayer meeting was two was pray. Because we feel inadequate to pray, and that's actually not a bad thing. When I first became a cross follower, I had never done the door of church until I came to Christ. And heard all this Christian language about prayer and stuff like that, and it was just foreign to me. Having a podcast, so I went to the pastor who had helped me find Christ, and I said, What's this prayer stuff? What's all of this? I've never read the Bible, I've never been to a church service. So he said, you want to go to pray? I said, yeah. And she said, right, turn up at my office at 5.30 in the morning. Well, I wasn't wanting that. And he said, you sit here and you watch me pray and have my quiet time. Sleep with it all to me. But he discipled like Jesus disciple, hands on. And then he sat down and discussed it. And I watched him kneel as Read the couch, I can still see it. Read the scriptures on his knees, and then we as he prayed for the congregation, as he prayed for the community, as he prayed for the nation. It's been similar to the disciples who watched the effectiveness of Jesus' ministry, and what did they say to the Lord of God? Teach us how to pray. Prayer begins with a teachable heart that I actually want to learn. It begins with a desire to want to pray. What teach you to pray? That's the weakness. I know how to pray, but there's a desire in me as a child of yours that I want to pray because I can see that prayer has an effectiveness. So I pray starts something with a desire, and then it leads to a discipline. If you read the life of Daniel, discover Daniel chapter 6, and it says Daniel, when he was being persecuted, went to his room and knelt down and prayed as he did three times a day. Morning, noon, and evening. I grew up with a Muslim father in a city Muslim community. They prayed five times a day. If you don't think that's having any effect, you are very disillusioned with you. You must be something here. All prayers have an effect for the Lord. 
Daniel, knowing he had a desire to pray, he disciplined that desire in his prayer room. Morning, noon, evening. If you think becoming charismatic or Pentecostal does the way with all of that, read the book of Acts, and Peter and John still follow that discipline and went to the people and the what? Power of prayer. Desire without discipline is a disillusionment. It's fantasy. If we do not discipline our desires, nothing happens. These are the lessons I learned from people like Daniel. Who's the one to learn to pray? I want to learn from people who are effective in prayer. I am not gifted in intercessory prayer. I try to join in intercessory prayer meetings and watch people pray and wail for two or three hours, but I'm like, I can't do that. I'm more like D.L. Moody, someone said to him, Mr. Moody, if you ever pray for an hour, you know that an hour people don't lie that I haven't prayed. So prayer is both a desire, it should be as natural as breathing. Yet there are times with the same with Daniel, when we discipline ourselves for these moments of prayer, because of the need, because of what's burning in us, or what we see going on around us. And then we find that discipline becomes just delight. Desire it, discipline it, and it will just become a natural delight. So for me, prayer is more like breathing as opposed to spending hours. You know, you hear a knee, you see a knee, and you start to find yourself going, oh, I'm to do that. And sometimes even a little prayer like that that's heartfelt is as effective as anything else. Prayer is the cry of the heart. A few things we learned from Daniel that I've learned over the years is this. If you enter a prayer first, I ask myself the question, am I interested or am I indifferent? Uh, another writer, I chose to put a short, put his words in the mouth of a character in one of his plays. He said, The wisdom towards our fellow creatures is not to hate them, but to be indifferent to them. That's the essence of the humanity. Hate is at least a strong emotion. Indifference is a terrible disease. Who I just don't care. Daniel was not so wrapped up in his own world and in himself that he was indifferent to all the news he was hearing around him. In chapter 2 of Daniel, Daniel is still in his teenage, adolescent, young adult years. And he hears about a need that the king is about to execute people who can't tell him what he dreamed and what the dream meant. Something impossible. So Daniel asks the king's advisor, he says, what's going on? Why? He asks two critical questions. What is happening in the world around me? And why is it happening? It's explained to Daniel. Daniel then goes to the king himself to get more information and to ask for a state of execution so that he can go back to his three friends, if you read it in Daniel 2, and he says to them, this is what's happening in the culture and the world that we are presently living in, even though we have been deported here as captives in a foreign land. This is where God has us. So we have a responsibility to respond to what we've heard. We can either be interested or indifferent. And Daniel and his friends get on their knees for what's the first thing they do today? They have a prayer meeting. They pray. Sometimes hearing all the stuff that goes on around us, but if you watch the news and the tragic news of 
uh, what's going on in the Middle East and all around the atmosphere, all around the world, sometimes music like that can become what a so overwhelming that we think, what can I possibly do to contribute? You can go to prayer. That's what Daniel did. He didn't at that point have any answers. But he knew that the sovereign God did. He knew it. I have to ask myself the question Am I indifferent to the world around me, to the suffering, the needs of others, or am I interested in? Sometimes I have to be honest when I was pastoring and standing at the door to say goodbye to people afterwards because they certain people make a beeline for you. And you just thought, I don't want to ask you how they are. Isn't that a terrible confession for a pastor? Because you knew that you were going to get very well informed. And then, as I always have things provoke information leads to cooperation. Do I perform? What am I going to do? I can no longer hold a position on the difference. I have to respond in some way. So sometimes we just don't want to listen. And that's you. But Daniel was interested in the world around him. As a teenager. And at this point, when I'm informed, I have a choice. How do I respond? I was to the church girl when he rose, memorized the stuff on the Second World War, the Stephen quote up here. Somebody challenged him as he was such an action kind of person. He said, I never worry about an action. And I actually just about finish. Daniel's interested. Secondly, Daniel's the person that you study and trust his life, who was informed by truth. What do I mean by that? In Daniel chapter 9, Daniel's getting on and yes, we're jumping decades now. Daniel is before the morning. And he goes to God with his word, and as he's watching kings and kingdoms rise and fall, and he's trying to understand what's happening here in the world around him. And he says, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures. Daniel was not interested in the six o'clock news. Because we all know social media and news is smarter. Just for that, it's how it works. I know that I have a friend who worked for like 40 years in TV, trained communicators, news presenters, told me how the system rolled. He could go and fill stuff for 30 minutes and then show 10 seconds. Soundbite, out of context, just to get we go to East Island, thank you. Thank you. Um, Daniel, in the instant of the world around him, took his truth from scriptures. Because when we come to prayer, when we come to processing the world in which we live in, we need a source of truth that informs our mind, that informs our prayers, as to what really is going on in the world around us. Everybody has a set of spectacles that has turned a worldview, how they look at the world, how they perceive it. 
was still impacted by the way you're raised, the home, your culture, the religion you're raised in, etc. But that worldview needs to be informed by a true view. What's the truth? Where do we get truth from? Can you view that within the scriptures, the truth is contained about everything pertaining to life? Who God is, what God is about. And as I hear the news, as I read the news, I come back to this book, to the truth of the scriptures, and say, What does God say about how I should live in this present world to represent Him well? And what is unfolding in the history of this world? And God has revealed it from beginning to end. Everything that is taking place around this period is not surprising. It's all laid out. All those ten things that I mentioned to you that happen and converge in society indicate society's ultimate demise. The storm of the book. The storm of the book. But we are meant to come here to be informed by truth, to fuel our prayers, and give us a basis for hope and stability that God is sovereignly in control. Nothing is called by Christ. Nothing. It isn't the truth of Scripture. When I am interested and I am informed, then the next thing you find with Daniel is he then invested himself in prayer to pray for those who are in rule, in leadership, in authority, for the culture around them. We have not come into the kingdom of God as God's sons and daughters just to touch and take it to heaven and just say, well, excuse my language here, the rest of the world can go to hell. I'm on my way to heaven. We have been born into the kingdom as Esther was saying or was headed for such a time as this. You are here, whatever your age or stage of your life is, for such a time as this. You must be any other period of time. And one of the greatest things that we can invest in our lives in is prayer. It's our chance to many people, and I see beautiful people with gray hair like myself. My dog's heart is scared. One reason they can offer what they can do. Health changes, energy levels subside of it. One of the greatest gifts you can give to this present age that you live in and the generations to come is laying down your time in prayer. I am here about to turn 65 soon. Because when I was a runaway teenager from home at the age of 16, a group of elderly ladies in the local Baptist church heard what my lifestyle was like, drug fueled alcohol fueled on the streets, hitchhiking through the North Island as a teenager. They made a commitment to pray for me every day. And to meet together once a week from now to pray for someone they didn't even know. A couple of years later, I came to faith in Christ. I did not hear his family pray for me. I was very concerned she was taking some of my faith. And our father of my son's three years, I would never have dared to ask someone like that. I'm always trying to get my daughters. I know where the lights are. And I'm not going. But I'm here all day, you know, I've not been on it. This is a great time. She prays for me every day to the day she died. She says, the one thing is right. And the trust is equal to your husband. She was placed before I knew. She just prayed. You 
you never get to go off the next generation. For we have you must pray and get to this out of my kind of background and our community, whenever we had chance, we would bring a child or an older person of the church who would become your own sister. When Daniel's in the city, he is in his panties. He is still interested. He is not saying, I served my time, I served kings and kingdoms, I had a, I'm retiring. They have told you that there is no retirement in the kingdom of God. The rest comes in glory. There is no retirement in the kingdom of God. I'll try. Daniel invested himself in a session. And Daniel chapter 10, we read the scripture. The angel came to Daniel as he rested before 21 days of prayer. And at the end of that, an angel comes to him and says, Daniel, from the first day you set your mind. This is a discipline thing here. Daniel's interest is in form. He invests time. He sets his mind that the Hebrew was said conveys the idea of a deliberate stance, position, and choice. It's now I know what I know. I'm going to set my mind, my heart, to one, understand the times and seasons I am in, and also to invest this time praying for the world around me, for God to intervene. Daniel set his mind. And Daniel has said it, and it's going to really come up as we wrap up. Three things I have discovered through the praise of a great man and woman in history, and through the scripture who's taken the praise of like someone like Nehemiah or Daniel or Abraham, Moses, anyone. There's a common thread to which they appeal in their prayers. And the first thing is very simple is this. They focus on the character of God. Prayer is essentially rational. It's not push the button, say the right words on a machine, and tell us what you want. God is not a dispensing machine. It is about relationship. One of the greatest things that you as a believer can ever do is to invest in through God's word to know God. Jesus defined eternal life as not a step, step of steps you take. He said in his prayer in John 17, and this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God. He said it's not God, it's a relationship. It's not a formula, it's a relationship. And what you find in the prayers of men like Daniel, Esther, the scriptures, Nehemiah, David, any of these great men and women of prayer, is you find that he focuses on the character of God, that he was loving, that he was kind, that he was righteous, that he was holy, that he was merciful, that he was forgiving, and they would appeal to these attributes of God. Isn't that what we do in communication when we're appealing to people even for help? I look at their character, not only that I could approach them. I have friends that I can call at 2 o'clock in the morning. They can call me at 2 o'clock in the morning. I need to return the favor one day. Why? Because they know through our friendship, we know each other's character, that we know each other's back. We want to do life shoulder to shoulder, and if they are in a desperate line of need, they know they can call me or knock on my door at any time. We need to know the character of God. Then He's loving, merciful, kind, just, forgiving. Because these are the things, and if you look at Daniel's prayer, that He appeals to constantly. God, the world around you is forming apart, but you're sovereign, you're 
you're in control. You're loving, you're calm, you're forgiving, you're merciful. I am healed of these things because I have a relationship with you. What was the first thing Jesus said to the disciples when they asked him to teach us how to pray? What were the first words? Our Father. Jesus was saying, prayer is a relationship. It's not a formula. You are coming to talk to your Father. Coming to talk to your Father. Secondly, and this is not a different one, that this great man or woman of prayer focused on was the confession of sin. I remember having a conversation with my non Christian boss when I was there. My first grade was a split screen printer. And um, we were talking about faith in God. And um, especially the sin came up. And as we were chatting, I turned to him and I said, Maybe you don't like talking about sin, do you? He said, No. And I walked away from the screen table. God doesn't dumb things down. And one of the things you find about being interested, informed, and invested in prayer is that I not only focus on the character of God, I focus on the cause of the breakdown of relationships, society, and culture. And God sums it up in one three little word. But the intense sister doesn't in prayer or attitude point the finger, lord it over anybody, or stand apart. But says, we are all in this together. One of the most common two-letter words you find in the intercessory place of scripture are we and us. Daniel, you when you pray at this day, Lord, all those people out here have done so many terrible things. This is why everything's breaking down. It's all their fault. Daniel got on his knees and said, Father, God, we have sinned with our lost world. He identified with the world. In a sense, we're saying, we're all in this together. I'm praying on behalf of everyone. I can part of the problem probably at some point. We are in this together. And we confess to God our sins. One of the prayers that I'm often confessing is God I forgive you for my prayers. I think the pages of the pastor when people would ask me about prayer and say, How long did you pray for, Pastor? I just came to that last week, and it belonged to that. It's not about the length of my prayer, it's about the heart cry. And lastly, they focused in this scheme on the covenant relationship that they had with God. That's why Daniel appeals to the character of God. Can we all of us together? But God has made a covenant relationship with us. And that's what Daniel appeals to in his prayer for his fellow people, the nation of Israel, when he said, God has made a covenant with Israel. And God does not break his word. God is a covenant-keeping God, and He will, if you want to read Romans 9 through 11, keep His covenant with His prayer. He's also made a covenant through the cross of Christ with every single one of us. And Romans 8 reveals that covenant with us, where it tells us, we like to read the verses, God works everything together for the good of those who love Him and call the glory to His purposes, etc., which is a wonderful thing. And then the purpose is to find that we can become like Christ. And the scriptures go on to say that if God did not spare his only son for us, we will not give us the everything we need. And that nothing can separate us blood from the love of God in Christ. God has made a covenant with us through Christ to say, to us, we 
They're all in this together. I've got your back. I've identified with you. And you identified with us in the person of Christ. Because if you've ever wondered what Jesus is doing now, He is interceding for us. It's been an incredible thought today. Hebrews 7.25 Therefore he is able to stay completely those who come to God's prisoner because he always lives to what? Can turn speed for him. Jesus was not indifferent. He didn't stay in heaven. He didn't stay as the default. He didn't stand aside. He stepped into the camp. Into the breach between heaven and earth, between sinful man and the holy God, and he said, I'll push it again. Through the cross. And when the cross was accomplished, and Jesus ascended, he has spent all that time interceding, and the Bible says he is able to stay completely. Not partially, completely all who come to him. Because he lives forever to intercede. I find that an incredibly overwhelming thought that Christ still loves me so much that in heaven he's continuing to pray for me. That I will come to completion. That I'll make it through this life. And for you, and for you, and for you. So one of the most Christ-like things we can do is follow this example and then to see. Step as we can. Get on our knees. Whether it's the long and tense prayer or it's just that. Because sometimes Brian's day says we don't know how to praise the Lord, but the Spirit does them in unutterable words, sighs and groanings. Sometimes my wife says, you sigh a lot. Sometimes, some of us just feel things. And sometimes you can't put it into words. It's just, it's a okay. Do you miss it? You're kind. You're able. You're sovereign. You're righteous. None of this is called you must the price. I did not change the world, but I can impact this for my priest. One of the most wonderful gifts that we can give to this world and generations to follow is now in this history of peace. This tends to be a Christmas class. Father, Father, may the desire of our prayers be that your will be done 
and you go back to the glory of God. Holy Spirit, have the Holy Spirit, Father God. Jesus, thank you that you are not speaking for us in our world, and you are able to stay completely all those who come to you. So those loved ones, neighbors, friends, people in the community, who we carry desires to know you, we thank you that our confidence is for serving your grace. And you are able. We will bless you, the Lord's you, the Lord's hands, 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 the Lord's hands